What's going on, everybody? And welcome to episode 29 of the Black Massacre series, where today I will be talking about the Charleston Church mass shooting, or should I say mass murder, of 2015. On June 17, 2015, a mass shooting or mass murder occurred in Charleston, South Carolina, in which nine black Americans were killed and a tenth was injured during a Bible study at the Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church. Among the fatalities was the senior pastor, State Senator Clementa C. Pinckney. Emmanuel AME is one of the oldest black churches in the United States, and it has long been a center for civil rights organization. The morning after the attack, police arrested Dylan Roof in Shelby, North Carolina, a 21-year-old white supremacist. He had attended the Bible study before opening fire. He was found to have targeted members of this church because of its history and status. Roof was found competent to stand trial in federal court. In December 2016, Roof was convicted of 33 federal hate crime and murder charges. On January 10, 2017, he was sentenced to death for those crimes. Roof was separately charged with nine counts of murder in the South Carolina state courts. In April 2017, Roof pleaded guilty to all nine state charges in order to avoid receiving a second death sentence. And as a result, he was sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. He will receive automatic appeals of his death sentence, but he may eventually be executed by the federal justice system. Roof espoused racial hatred in both a website manifesto, which he published before the shooting, and a journal, which he wrote from jail afterward. On his website, Roof posted photos of emblems which are associated with white supremacy, including a photo of the Confederate battle flag. The shooting triggered debates about modern display of the flag and other com commemorations of the Confederacy. Following these murders, the South Carolina General Assembly voted to remove the flag from state capitol grounds and a wave of Confederate monument or memorial removals followed shortly thereafter. At the time, it was the deadliest mass shooting at a place of worship in U.S. history paralleling the Waddell Buddhist temple shooting in 1991 in which nine people were also killed and then superseded by the Sutherland Springs Church shooting in Texas in 2017 and the Pittsburgh Synagogue shooting in Pennsylvania in 2018. As of 2023, it is the deadliest mass shooting in South Carolina history. Founded in 1816, the church has played an important role in the history of South Carolina, including the slavery era and reconstruction, the civil rights movement and the Black Lives Matter. It is the oldest African Methodist Episcopal Church in the South, often referred to as Mother Emanuel. The AME Church was founded by Richard Allen in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in 1814 as the first independent black denomination. It is a historically black congregation, one of the oldest south of Baltimore. When one of the church's co-founders, Denmark Vesey, was suspected of plotting to launch a slave rebellion in Charleston, 1822, 35 people, including Vesey, were hanged and the church was burned down. Charleston citizens accepted the claim that a slave rebellion was expected to begin at the stroke of midnight on June 16, 1822, and it was expected to erupt the following day. The shooting in 2015 occurred on the 193rd anniversary of the thwarted uprising. As the rebuilt church was formally shuttered with uh, other all-black congregations in the city, by the city in 1834, the congregation met in secret until 1865 when it was formally reorganized and it was acquired by the name Emmanuel, which means God with us. It was rebuilt based on a design which was drawn by Denmark Vesey's son. That structure was badly damaged in the 1886 Charleston earthquake, the current building dates from 1891. The church's senior pastor, Reverend Clementa C. Pinckney, had held rallies after the shooting of Walter Scott by a white police officer two months earlier in nearby Charleston. As a state senator, Pinckney pushed for legislation requiring police to wear body cameras. Several commentators noted that a similarity between existed between the massacre at e Emmanuel AME and the 1963 16th Street Baptist Church bombing of a politically af active African-American church in Birmingham, Alabama, when the Ku Klux Klan killed four black girls and injured 14 others during the civil rights movement. This attack galvanized support for federal civil rights legislation. Numerous scholars, journalists, activists, and politicians have emphasized their belief that the attacks should not be treated as an isolated event, because in their view, 
it occurred within the broader context of racism against black Americans and racism in the United States. In 1996, Congress had passed the Church Arson Prevention Act, which considers the damaging of religious property a federal crime because of its racial or ethnic character in response to a spat to a spat of 154 suspicious church bombings which had occurred since 1991. More recent arson attacks against black churches included a black church in Massachusetts that was burned down the day after the first inauguration of Barack Obama in 2009. At around 9.05 p.m. on Wednesday, June 17, 2015, the Charleston Police Department began receiving calls of a shooting at Emanuel AME Church. Dylan S. Roof, a man described as white with sandy brown hair, around 21 years old and 5 feet 9 inches tall in height, wearing a gray sweatshirt and jeans, opened fire with a Glock 41 45 caliber handgun on a group of people inside the church at a Bible study attended by Pinckney. He had first attended the meeting as a participant that evening. Roof then fled the scene. He had been carrying eight magazines holding hollow point bullets. The event was finished by 11, 9-11 p.m. During the hour preceding the attack, a 13 people, including the shooter, participated in the Bible study. According to the accounts of people who talked to survivors, when Roof walked into the historic black church, he immediately asked for Pinckney and sat down next to him. Initially listening to others during the study, he disagreed with some of the discussion of scripture. After other participants began praying, he stood up and aimed a gun. He pulled away from a fanny pack at 87-year-old Susie Jackson, Jackson's nephew, 26-year-old Taiwanza Sanders, tried to talk him down and asked him why he was attacking churchgoers. The shooter said, I have to do it. You violate our women and you're taking over our country and you have to go. When Roof said he intended to shoot them all, Sanders dove in front of Jackson and was shot first. Roof fired at the other victim shouting racial epithets he reportedly said y'all want something to pray about i'll give you something to pray about roof reloaded his gun five times sanders mother and his five-year-old niece who also attended the study survived the shooting by pretending to be dead on the floor dot scott president of the local branch of the naacp says she had heard from victims relatives that roof spared one woman Polly Shepard, saying that she could tell other people what had happened. He asked, did I shoot you? She replied, no. Then he said, good, because we need someone to survive because I'm going to shoot myself and you'll be the only survivor. According to the son of one victim who spoke to that survivor, Roof allegedly turned the gun to his own head and pulled the trigger, but discovered he was out of ammunition. He left the church, reportedly after making another racially inflammatory statement over the victim's bodies. The entire shooting lasted for approximately six minutes. Several hours later, a bomb threat was called into the courtyard by Marriott Hotel on Calhoun Street. This complicated the police investigation of the shooting as they needed to evacuate the immediate area. The mortally wounded victims, six women and three men, were all black American members of the AME Church. Eight died at the scene. The ninth, Daniel Simmons, died at the MUSC Medical Center. They were all killed by multiple gunshots fired at close range. Five people survived the shooting unharmed, including Felicia Sanders, mother of slain victim Taiwanza Sanders, and her five-year-old granddaughter, as well as Polly Shepard, a Bible study member. Pinckney's wife and youngest daughter were inside the building during the shooting, but were in the pastor's office with the doors locked. A tenth victim was also injured in the event. Those killed... Those killed were identified as Clementa C. Pinckney, the church's pastor and South Carolina state senator, Cynthia Graham Hurd, a Bible study member and a branch manager for the Charleston County Public Library System, sister of former state senator Malcolm Graham, Susie Jackson, the oldest victim who was a Bible study and church choir member, Ethel Lee Lance, the church's sexton, the Payne Middleton doctor, a pastor who was also employed as a school administrator and admissions coordinator at the Southern Wesleyan University. Taiwanza Sanders, the youngest victim who was a graduate of Allen University, grandnephew of victim Susie Jackson. Daniel L. Simmons, a pastor who also served at Greater Zion AME Church in Amid Allendahl. Sh Shawanda Coleman Singleton, a pastor who also a speech therapist and track coach at Goose Creek High School, and Myra Thompson, a Bible study teacher. The victims were later collectively refer referred to as the Emmanuel Nine. Dylan Storm Roof, 
was named by the Federal Bureau of Investigation as the suspected killer after his father and uncle contacted police to positively identify him upon seeing security photos of him in the news. Ruth was born in Columbia, South Carolina and was living in a largely black American Eastover at the time of the attack. Ruth had a prior police record consisting of two arrests for trespassing and drug possession, both made in the months before the attack. According to then FBI Director James Comey, a police report detailing Ruth's admission to a narcotics offense should have prevented him from purchasing the weapon used in the shooting. An administrative error within the National Intent Criminal Background Check system excluded Ruth's admission, though not the arrest itself, from appearing on his mandatory background check. His Facebook page included an image of Ruth wearing a jacket decorated with two emblems among popular among American white supremacists, the flag of the former Rhodesia, now known as Zimbabwe, and the flag of apartheid era South Africa. Ruth reportedly told friends and neighbors he intended to kill people, including a plot to attack the College of Charleston, but his claims were not taken seriously. On June 20th, bloggers discovered a website called The Last Rhodesian and it had been registered to a Dylan Roof on February 9th, 2015. The website included what appeared to be an unsigned manifesto containing Roof's opinions of blacks, Jews, Hispanics, and East Asians, as well as a cache of photos, including an image of Roof posing with a handgun and a Confederate battle flag. In this manifesto, Roof says he became racially aware as a result of the 2012 killing of Trayvon Martin, writing that when he learned about the incident, he read about it, concluding that George Zimmerman had been in the right. He did not understand the controversy about it. He said he had searched for black on white crime, quote unquote, on Google and found the website of the Council of Conservative Citizens, where he read pages upon pages of cases involving black people murdering white people. Ruth wrote that he had never been the same since that day. According to web server logs, Ruth's website was last modified at 4.44 p.m. on June 17th, the day of the shooting, when Ruth noted, At the time of writing, I am in a great hurry. An unidentified source said interrogations with Ruth after his arrest determined he had been planning the attack for around six months. He had researched Emanuel AME Church and targeted because of his role in black American history. A friend who briefly hid Ruth's gun from him said, I don't think the church was his primary target because he told us he was going for the school, but I think he couldn't get into the school because of the security, so he just settled for the church. Ruth's cell phone and computer were seized and analyzed by the FBI. According to unnamed officials, he was in online communications with other white supremacists who did not appear to have encouraged the massacre. The investigation was said to have widened to include other persons of interest. Federal prosecutors said in August 2016 that Ruth was self-radicalized online instead of adopting his white supremacist ideology through his personal associations or experiences with white supremacist groups or individuals or others. The attack was treated as a hate crime by the police. Officials from the Federal Bureau of Investigation and Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives were called in to assist in the investigation and manhunt. On the morning after the attack, police received a tip off from a woman who recognized Ruth and his car, a black Hyundai Elantra with South Carolina license plates and a three flag Confederate States of America bumper decoration. On U.S. Route 74, recalling security images taken at the church and distributed to the media. She later recalled, I got closer and I saw that haircut. I was nervous. I had the worst feeling. Is that him or not him? She called her employer who contacted local police and then tailed the suspect's car for 35 miles until she was certain authorities were moving in for an arrest. At 1044 a.m., Roof was captured in a traffic stop in Shelby, North Carolina, approximately 245 miles from the shooting scene. A 45 caliber pistol was found in the car during the arrest. Roof waived his extradition rights and was flown to Sheriff Al Cannon Detention Center in North Charleston on the evening of June 18th. At the jail, his cell block neighbor was Michael Slager, the former North Charleston police officer charged with murder after shooting Walter Scott following a traffic stop. According to unconfirmed reports, Roof confessed to committing the attack and said he wanted to start a race war. He reportedly told investigators he almost did not complete his plan because members of the church group had been so nice to him. On June 19th, Roof was charged with nine counts of murder and one count of possession of a firearm during the commission of a violent crime. 
He first appeared in Charleston County Court via video conference at a bond hearing later that day. At the hearing, shooting survivors and relatives of the five of the victims spoke to Roof directly, saying they were praying for his soul and forgave him. The judge, Charleston County Chief Magistrate James Skip Gosnell Jr., said at the bond hearing that in addition to the dead victims and their families, there are victims on this young man's side of the family. Nobody would have ever thrown them into the whirlwind of events that they are being thrown into. The judge was reported to have been reprimanded in 2005 by the South Carolina Supreme Court for using a racial slur while on the bench in 2003. Gosnell set a $1 million bond for the weapons possessing charge and no bail on the nine counts of murder. Governor Nikki Haley called on prosecutors to seek the death penalty against Ruth. In June 2016, she warned against the vice of rhetoric, saying that it would lead to tragedies such as the massacre at the church and referred to the rhetoric in 2016 presidential candidate Donald Trump. On July 7th, Roof was indicted on the nine murder charges and the weapons charge, as well as three new charges of attempted murder, one for each person who survived the shooting. He also faced federal hate crime charges, including nine counts of using a firearm to commit murder and 24 civil rights violations, 12 hate crime charges and 12 counts of violating a person's freedom of religion, with 18 of those charges carrying the federal death penalty. On July 31st, Ruth pleaded not guilty to the federal charges based on the advice of his lawyer, David Bruck. Bruck earlier said Ruth wanted to plead guilty, but he couldn't advise it without knowing the government's intentions. On September 3rd, Ninth Circuit solicitor or the district attorney, Scarlett Wilson, announced that she intended to seek the death penalty against Ruth in the state proceedings based on more than two people being killed in the shooting and others' lives put at risk. On September 16th, Ruth said through his attorney that he was willing to plead guilty in exchange for a sentence of life imprisonment without parole. On October 1st, the federal trial was pushed back to at least January 2016 to give prosecutors and Ruth's attorneys more time to prepare. On December 1st, the trial was postponed again to an unknown date. Both Ruth and his friend Joey Meek, who was accused of misprison of felony and lying to investigators about Ruth's plans, were to reappear in federal court on February 11, 2016, while their lawyers held a bar meeting with prosecutors to discuss their cases. On November 7, 2016, U.S. District Judge Richard Gergel postponed jury selection until November 9th later postponing the process again until November 21st. Gurgle later postponed the jury selection to November 28th. On November 28th, a federal judge granted a motion by Ruth to represent himself. On December 4th, Ruth made a handwritten request of Gurgle asking for his defense team for guilt phase of his federal death penalty trial. On December 5th, 2016, Gurgle allowed Ruth to hire back his lawyers for the guilt phase of his trial. On December 6th, 2016, a federal judge denied a motion by Ruth's defense team to delay Ruth's trial. The decision to seek the death penalty for Ruth was a campaign topic in the 2016 Democratic presidential primaries with Hillary Clinton supporting the Justice Department's decision and Bernie Sanders opposing it. In November 2016, Ruth was declared competent to stand trial for the crimes. In January 2017, followed, following a second competency evaluation, Ruth was again deemed competent. Ruth's trial began on December 7, 2016. Witnesses gave testimony describing the shooting in graphic detail. On December 15, 2016, Ruth was found guilty of all 33 federal charges against him. For the sentencing phase of the federal trial, Ruth dismissed his attorneys and insisted on representing himself. In a statement to the court at his sentencing hearing on January 4, 2017, Ruth offered no apology or explanation, saying, there's nothing wrong with me psychologically. At the hearing, prosecutors introduced into evidence a two-page excerpt from a journal written by Ruth from jail six weeks after his arrest, in which Ruth composed a white supremacist manifesto, writing, I would like to make it crystal clear. I do not regret what I did. I am not sorry. I have not shed a tear for the innocent people I have killed. Ruth was sentenced to death on January 10th, 2017, and to life in prison without parole on April 10th, 2017. Heidi Barrick, the director of the Intelligence Project for the Southern Poverty Law Center, a nonprofit that seeks to identify American hate groups and confront their activities, said that the gunman's reported motive was frequently appeared on white supremacist websites. They say that whites are being hugely victimized by blacks and no one is paying, att paying attention. 
Referring to Ruth's comments about violations, Barrick said black men sexually assaulting white women is probably the oldest racist trope we have in the US. According to Barrick, this trope is related to the myth of Southern culture because in fact, black American women have been much more frequently abused by white men. Lisa Lindquist Dorr, associate professor at the University of Alabama said that the myth of black violators had dominated the imaginations of white Southern men who believe that sexual access to women is a trophy of power. White women embody virtue and morality. They signify whiteness and white superiority. So sexual access to white women was possessing the ultimate privilege that white men held. It views women as trophies, which are to be traded among men. Jamel Bowie wrote in Slate, Make any list of anti-black terrorism in the United States and you'll have a list of attacks justified by the specter of black violations. He cited the Tulsa race riot of 1921, the Rosewood massacre of 1923, and the murder of 14-year-old Emmett Till in 1955 as examples. Barrick said that early in the investigation, it was unclear if the suspect had any connection to hate groups. She noted that for several years, Southern Calif Carolina, South Carolina, has been the place with the highest density of hate groups. At Morris Brown African Methodist Episcopal Church in Charleston, a numerous amount of people of different races and religions attended a ceremony commemorating the victims. They proclaimed that the attack would not divide their community. Another such ceremony occurred at the TD Arena in the College of Charleston. On June 21st, four days after the shooting, Emmanuel A. Mead Church reopened for its Sunday worship service. The Reverend Dr. Norval Goff Sr., presiding elder of the Emmanuel A. Mead Church, delivered the sermon. On June 25th, 2015, at Emmanuel A. Mead Church, funerals were held for victims Ethel Lance and Sharonda Coleman Singleton, and they were attended by several political figures and civil rights leaders. Clementa Pinckney's funeral was held in the basketball arena of the College of Charleston on June 26, 2015, with President Barack Obama delivering the eulogy. Earlier, Pinckney's body lay in state in the South Carolina State House. This was followed by the funerals of Taiwan Sanders, Susie Jackson, and Cynthia Graham Heard the next day. Heard's family announced that they are establishing the Cynthia Graham Heard Fund for Reading and Literacy Organization in her memory. It is expected to give children easier access to books. By July 2nd, the last of the victims, Daniel Simmons, was buried. Nine artists from across the United States created portraits of the victims as tribute to them. The portraits were put onto display in the principal gallery for one month and afterwards they were given to the victims' families. The artists who were involved in the memorial included Ricky Mujica, Mario Andres Robinson, Lauren Tilden, Paul McCormick, Gregory Mortensen, Catherine Prescott, Terry Strickland, Judy Tockets, and Stephanie Deshpond. Some criticism has been aimed towards the community forgiveness of Ruth. The Black Lives Matter movement has protested against the shooting. Questions were raised about the security of the black churches as well as the security of churches in general and their long-standing practice of welcoming anyone who is willing to pray as most Christian churches are regardless of the race of the majority of its parishioners. Ruth, a stranger to churchgoers, was easily able to enter Emmanuel AME Church with no questions asked. In the weeks after the shooting, AME church leaders distributed a document titled 12 Considerations for Congressional Security, which recommended that they create security plans and teams for black churches, improve communications, develop relationships with local law enforcement, and secure and monitor all entrances to exits, to and exits from churches. Some churches considered hiring armed security guards and installing metal detectors, but conversations in support of these steps have currently not gained traction. The FBI is investigating possible church arson after several black churches burned down in one week's time following the shooting. On July 3rd, Time reported that investigations concluded that the fires were unrelated. The FBI underwent a 30-day review to examine the lapses in the background check system that allowed the suspect shooter to legally purchase the gun used in the shooting. According to James Comey, Ruth had been arrested in March on a felony drug charge, which would have required an inquiry into the charge during the background check examination. However, he was actually arrested on a misdemeanor drug charge, which was incorrectly written as a felony at first due to a data entry error made by a jail clerk. The mistake was noticed by the jail two days after the arrest, but the change was not made. 
The FBI agent conducting the background check examination then called the wrong agency while making the inquiry into the drug charge due to having limited information on law enforcement agencies in Lexington County. This subsequently allowed Ruth to make the purchase. However, despite the misdemeanor charge, he still should not have been able to purchase the gun under a law that barred anyone who was unlawful user of an of or an addicted to a controlled substance from owning firearms. Several bills aiming to fix this loophole were proposed in South Carolina legislation plan to discuss the loophole in 2016. On July 1st, 2016, survivors of the shooting sued the FBI inadvertent for inadvertently enabling Ruth to purchase the gun, which was used in the shooting. On August 30 of 2019, the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals ruled that the survivors and families got the, of the deceased can sue the federal government. On September 17th, Joey Meek, one of Ruth's friends who briefly hid his gun away from him, was arrested, reportedly for lying to federal authorities during the investigation and failing to report a crime. The next day, he pleaded not guilty to one count of making false statements to federal investigators and one count of concealing knowledge about a crime. He faced the maximum of nine years in prison and a $500,000 fine. According to legal experts, prosecutors possibly intended to use the prospect of federal charges against him as leverage for testi his testifying against Ruth. Meek pleaded guilty in federal court in April 29, 2016. He was sentenced to 27 months in prison in March 2017. Charleston Mayor Joseph P. Riley Jr. denounced the attack and said of all cities in Charleston to have a horrible, hateful person go into the church and kill people there to pray and worship with each other is something that is beyond any comprehension and is not explained. We are going to put our arms around that church and that church family. South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley said, while we do not yet know all of the details, we do know that we'll never understand what motivates anyone to enter one of our places of worship and take the life of another. Please join us in lifting up the victims and their families with our love and prayers. President Barack Obama said in Charleston on June 18th, once again, innocent people were killed in part because someone who wanted to inflict harm had no trouble getting their hands on a gun. We as a country will have to reckon with the fact that this type of mass violence does not happen in other advanced countries. At a Washington press conference later that day, he said, Michelle and I know several members of the Emmanuel AME Church. We knew their pastor, Reverend Clementa Pinckney, who along with eight others gathered in prayer and fellowship and was murdered last night. And to say our thoughts and prayers are with them and their families and their community doesn't say enough to convey the heartache and the sadness and the anger that we feel. On June 19th, the United States Department of Justice fast-tracked a crime victim assistance formula grant of $29 million to the South Carolina government. Some of the money will be allocated to the survivors. After Ruth's appearance at his bond hearing, his family issued a statement expressing their shock and grief at his actions. Following the funerals of several of the victims in the shooting, they issued a second statement expressing their condolences to the victims' families and announcing the temporary postponement of comments out of respect for them. During the bond hearing, several family members of the victims told Ruth that they forgave him. The local community surrounding Charleston held prayer vigils and fundraisers. A mass unity rally was also held on the Arthur Ravenel Bridge on the evening of June 21st. Organizers of the rally claimed there were up to 20,000 supporters in the rally. Tens of thousands of individuals crossed from the Mount Pleasant side of the bridge to the downtown Charleston side carrying supportive signs and flags. Dozens of boats joined in the procession as well. The World Methodist Council, an association of the worldwide churches of the Methodist tradition of which the AME Church is a part, said it urges prayer and support for the victims, families, and those members of Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church who have been so gravely affected by this crime motivated by hate. The president and vice president of the British Methodist Conference, also a member of the World Methodist Council, sent a letter of solidarity to the African Methodist Episcopal Church saying the hearts of the members of the Methodist Church of Great Britain go out to the families and friends of those killed, to the church and to the wider communities of Charleston. The councils of bishops of the United Methodist Church, also a member of the World Methodist Council and in full communion with the African Methodist Episcopal Church, called on its members to support the victims of this and all acts of violence, to work to end racism and hatred, and to seek peace with justice, and to live the prayer that our Lord gave us, that God's kingdom come and will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church, also a member of the World Methodist Council in full communion with the African Methodist Episcopal Church, shared its support with the presiding bishop, stating, let us join with the AMEs in prayer for the healing of the families touched by this tragedy, the families of the victims and of the family of the perpetrator. The Reverend Olaf Fisk Tviet, General Secretary of the World Council of Churches, said, we offer our prayers and healing to the wounded and traumatized in solidarity and accompaniment to our sisters and brothers in the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Archbishop Joseph Edward Kurtz, the presiding president of U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, made similar remarks. On August 8, 2019, the Churchwide Assembly of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America adopted a resolution to recognize the Emmanuel Nine as martyrs to their litur liturgical liturgical, excuse me, calendar and declared June 17th as a day of repent, rep, repentance in the ELCA for the martyrdom of the Emmanuel Nine. At the time of the shooting, Dylan Roof was a member of the ECLA congregation. The Reverend Clementa Pinckney and the Reverend Daniel Simmons were both alumni of Lutheran Theological Southern Seminary, a seminary of the ECLA. Various national Jewish organizations, including the American Jewish Committee, Union for Reform Judaism, Jewish Federations of North America, Anti-Defamation League, and Orthodox Union, issued statements deploring the attack and expressing deep grief and horror. The rabbinical assembly, in its own statement, quoted Leviticus saying, Do not stand idly by the blood of your neighbor. Hateful, violent acts such as this have no place in our society and a country known for its diversity and blending of various cultures. Many national Muslim organizations and individuals, imams, such as Council on American Islamic Relations Islamic Society of North America and the Islamic Circle of North America, issue statements condemning the attack and offering sympathy for the victims. In a joint statement, CAIR and Muslim leaders in Baltimore quoted the Quran saying the Quran, the Muslim holy book says he who takes one life, it is as he has slain all of mankind and he who saves one life, it is as if he has saved all of mankind. Muslim and Jewish religious organizations have raised several hundred thousand dollars to help rebuild black churches that were burned down in the weeks after the shooting. At least 18 candidates and prospective candidates for the 2016 U.S. presidential election expressed reactions through various media and addresses. According to NPR, Democratic and Republican candidates found different ways to address the incident, with Democrats seeing race and gun control as essential issues, while Republicans pointing to mental illness and referring to it as tragic but a random act. Most Republican candidates eventually acknowledged that race was a motivating factor for the shooting. According to the Christian Science Monitor, the shooting became a precarious subject for Republican presidential contenders, and particularly in regard of the racial motivations behind it. As South Carolina holds primaries and the state's political importance have resulted in some candidates skirting around the clear racial motivations behind the attack. The night following the attack, John Stewart delivered a monologue on The Daily Show discussing the tragic nature of the news, condemning the attacks as well as the media's response to it. Stewart argued that in response to Islamic terrorism, politicians declared they will do whatever they can to make America safe, even justifying torture. But respond to this mass shooting with, what are you going to do? Crazy is as crazy does. The Council of Conservative Citizens, who website Roof cited as a source for his radicalization issued a statement on his website unequivocally condemning the attack but that roof has some legitimate grievances against black people an additional statement from the group's president earl holt iii disavowed responsibility for the crime and said the group's website accurately and honestly reports black on white black on white violent crime in an online forum, Charles Cotton, a lawyer in Houston and a national board member of the National Rifle Association, placed blame of the shooting on Pinckney for not allowing the churchgoers to hold concealed carry weapons inside the church. In 2011, Pinckney had voted against legislation that would allow concealed handguns to be carried into public spaces. Cotton also criticized the effect effectiveness of gun-free zones, stating, if we look at mass shootings that occur, most happen in gun-free zones. Cotton's comment has since been deleted from the online forum. 
Following the shooting, Rhodesians Worldwide, an online magazine catering to the Rhodesian expatriate community, issued a brief statement condemning Ruth's actions in response to his use of the Rhodesian flag. It said 80% of the Rhodesian security forces were black and that Rhodesian Bush War was a struggle against communism rather than a racial conflict. Jerry Richardson, the owner of NFL's Carolina Panthers, donated $100,000 to the Mother Emanuel Hope Fund set up by Mayor Riley, specifically calling for $10,000 each to the families of the nine victims to cover their funeral expenses and the remaining $10,000 to be delivered to the Emanuel AME Church itself. Artist Carrie Mae Weems has created a theater piece in response to the murders called Grace Notes. Civil rights advocates said that the Charleston attack did more than fit the dictionary definition of terrorism because it also reflected on the history of attempts to terrorize black Americans by the Ku Klux Klan and other white supremacist groups. According to the state of Tennessee, a 2017 church shooting that killed a woman and wounded seven others was retaliation for the Charleston shooting. The perpetrator, who was black, reportedly said that he wanted to kill 10 white people and referenced Ruth and the Pan-African flag in a note he left in the car. On June 18, 2015, the day after the shooting, many flags, including those of the South Carolina State House, were flown at half-staff. The Confederate battle flag flying over the South Carolina Confederate Monument near the State House was not lowered, as South Carolina law prohibited alteration of the flag without the consent of two thirds of the state legislature. Additionally, the flagpole lacked a pulley system, meaning the flag could not be flown at half staff, only removed. Calls to remove the Confederate flag from the State House grounds, as well as debates over the context of a symbolic nature, were renewed after the attack by several prominent figures including President Barack Obama, Mitt Romney, and Jeb Bush. On June 20th, 2015, several thousand people gathered in front of the South Carolina State House in protest. An online petition at MoveOn.org encouraging the flag's removal had received over 30, 370,000 signatures by that time. At a State House press conference on June 22nd, Governor Nikki Haley flanked by elected officials of both parties, including U.S. Republican Senators Lindsey Graham and Tim Scott and former Republican Governor Mark Sanford, called for the flag to be removed by the state legislature, saying that while the flag was an integral part of our past, it does not represent the future of South Carolina. Eulogizing the Reverend Clementa Pinckney on June 26, 2015, before 5,000 congregants on the College of Charleston, President Barack Obama acknowledged that the shooting had catalyzed a broad movement backed by Republicans and Democrats to remove the flag from the official public display. Blinded by hatred, the gunmen failed to comprehend what Reverend Pinckney so well understood the power of God's grace, Obama said. By taking down that flag, we express God's grace, but I don't think God wants us to stop there. On July 6, 2015, the South Carolina Senate voted to remove the Confederate flag from display outside the South Carolina State House. Following 13 hours of debate, the vote in the House to remove it was passed by a two-thirds majority of 94 to 20 on July 9th. Governor Nikki Haley signed the bill on July 9th, and on July 10th, the Confederate flag was taken down for the last time. It will be stored until it can be later shown at a museum. On June 23, 2015, retailers Walmart, Amazon.com, Sears Holding Corporation, which owns Sears and Kmart, and eBay all announced plans to stop selling merchandise with the Confederate flag. Similarly, Warner Brothers announced they were halting production on General Lee car toys, which prominently featured a Confederate flag on the roof. Many major flag manufacturers also decided to stop profiting from the flag. The city of New Orleans has announced plans to remove four memorials related to confederacy two of them the battle of liberty place monument and the jefferson davis monument have been removed as of may 11 2017 in reaction to the controversy regarding the confederate flag's modern displays institutions across the u.s have considered removing the names of historic confederate figures from schools colleges and streets campaigns to change the names were started in several cities in a national survey, which was conducted in 2015, 57% of Americans opined that the Confederate flag represented Southern pride rather than racism. 
A previous poll which was conducted in 2000 had a nearly identical result of 59%. However, poll results which were only collected from citizens were, who were living in the South yielded different results. 75% of whites described the flag as a symbol of pride, while 75% of blacks said that that flag represented racism. Earl Holt, the leader of the Council of Conservative Citizens, whose website Ruth credited for shaping its views in his manifesto, gave more than $74,000 to Republican candidates and committees in recent years, including campaign donations to 2016 presidential candidates Ted Cruz, Rick Santorum, and Rand Paul, who have all condemned Ruth's racially based motives. Following the shooting and after a journalist contacted the campaigns with details about the donor's background, a spokesman for the Ted Cruz campaign said that he would return an $8,500 donation to Holt. The campaign later said that it would donate $11,000 to the Mother Emanuel Hope Fund to assist the victim's families. The Rand Paul campaign said Holt's $2,250 donation would be given to the fund and Rick Santorum said that his $1,500 donation from Holt would be donated to the same charity. Twelve other Republican officeholders also announced they would be returning or donating Holt's contributions. While some media professionals, politicians, and law enforcement officials referred to the attack as an act of domestic terrorism, others did not. This renewed a debate about the terminology which people should use whenever they describe the shooting and other attacks. On June 18th, professor and terrorism expert Brian Phillips offered his definition of terrorism by saying the shooting was clearly a terrorist act. He based his conclusion on a racist political motivation that seems likely in his intimidation of a wider audience criterion was met when the shooter reportedly left one person alive to spread the message. An article by CNN National Security Analyst Peter Bergen and David Sturman on June 19th says, By any reasonable standard, this is terrorism, which is generally defined as an act of violence against civilians by individuals or organizations for political purposes. Deadly acts of terrorism by virulent races and anti-government extremists have been more common in the United States than deadly acts of jihadist terrorism since 9-11. Some publications in their analysis of the event said that these naming discrepancies, discrepancies reflect either forms of denial or outright racism. The journalist Glenn Greenwald wrote that almost immediately news reports indicated that there was no sign of terrorism by which they meant it does not appear that the shooter is Muslim. And other than the perpetrator's non-Muslim identity, the Charleston attack from the start had the indica indicia of what is commonly understood to be terrorism emphasis and original speaking at a press conference in baltimore on june 19th fbi director james comey said while his agency was investigating the shooting as a hate crime he did not consider it an act of terrorism citing the lack of political motivation for the suspect's actions he said terrorism is an act of violence done or threatened in order to try to influence a public body or citizenry so it's more of a political act and again, based on what I know, I don't see this as a political act. Doesn't make it any less horrific, but terrorism has a definition under federal law. Heidi Barrett, who leads the intelligence project at the Southern Poverty Law Center, pointed to the discovery of a website attributed to Ruth, which featured a manifesto and 60 photos up as an example as to why federal agents don't have themselves together on this issue. The website began circulating on the internet on June 20th. Barrick said the way they found the website was that someone ran a domain tool, reverse search on this guy's name. It wasn't rocket science, but where were the feds? On June 24th, FBI spokesman Paul Bresson left the possibility of terrorism charges open, saying any ev eventual federal charges will be determined by the facts of the conclusion of the investigation and are not influenced by how the investigation is initially opened. Ultimately, it is up to the Justice the Department of Justice prosecutors to decide what federal charges to bring. A spokesperson for Attorney General Loretta Lynch said the Department of Justice was investigating the shooting as both a hate crime and as an act of domestic terrorism. The infamy of Roof in the shooting has inspired imitators to plot similar attacks. Benjamin Thomas Samuel McDowell was arrested for unlawful firearm possession. He had been planning to shoot up the Temple Imanu El Sec Synagogue in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. While Elizabeth Lacron and Vincent Armstrong were arrested for plotting to use explosive to commit upscale mass murder in Toledo, Ohio, having previously corresponded with Ruth himself.
A violent neo-Nazi subculture which glorifies Ruth and other far-right mass murderers has also emerged and it is known as the Bowl Gang or the Bowl Patrol, referring to Ruth's distinctive bowl haircut. On October 29, 2021, the Justice Department agreed to pay $88 million to the families of the victims and the wounded. The settlement comes about after relatives of the victims sued the FBI because it had a faulty background check system which had allowed Ruth to purchase the gun that he used in the shooting. The relatives of the deceased will receive $6 million and $7.5 million while, other, while five other people who sustained injuries will receive five million dollars now one thing i usually have not done when it comes to the other black massacre series that i'm doing with this one is inserting two things that they left out that i wish that they had in there basically on the research that i had so far one of the main ones was dylan roof being taken to burger king i know a lot of people were listening and saying when is Torian going to mention the part about him being taken to burger king i didn't want to say anything because i wanted to make sure or see if they were going to throw that in there but they ironically left that out but yes, as many people remember, on his way back from him being captured all the way in North Carolina, he was taken to Burger King to get something to eat before they eventually took him to prison. This is a picture right here of after they took him to Burger King, clearly. This is him right here uh, being read some of his rights via video. But this was after he was taken to Burger King. And a lot of people were very upset about that because we had never heard of that happening before this. And honestly, I don't believe we have ever seen it happen after this. But it was very ironic that he was taken to Burger King after he just slaughtered nine black people inside of a historically black church. The other one that we have to acknowledge, of course, is something else that they didn't talk about or someone I should say they didn't talk about. And that was Dwayne Stafford. And we got to make sure we keep his name attached to this as well, because he was the one that put hands on Dylan Roof. I'm actually going to read a little bit from this excerpt uh, where, uh, where they're talking about him. It says the ex jailbird who gave alleged Charleston mass murderer Dylan Roof a prison beatdown said his attack reminded him of the Alfred Hitchcock classic Psycho. It was like in the movies when the girl is in the shower and she gets startled. Dwayne Stafford, age 26, told the website Black Collective. During the assault last week, Roof didn't speak whole sentences. It was more like whining. His cheeks were scarred, according to Stafford. The attack left Dylan Roof's face and back bruised, according to a police report. Roof and his attorneys did not press charges following the incident. Roof has been in solitary confinement since he was arrested on June 18, 2015, a day after his deadly shooting rampage at the Emanuel AME Church in Charleston. Stafford was released from the Charleston County Detention Center on a $100,000 bond a day after assaulting 22-year-old Roof with whom he regularly spoke on August 8th. And that was mainly due to black people collectively getting on code and putting money on his books. He said he wanted to cozy up to Roof in order to get inside the sicko's head. This is why many people compared Dwayne Stafford to Christopher Scarver, who we know what he did to Jeffrey Dahmer back in 1994. It, the parallels were the same. The only difference is Dwayne Stafford wasn't able to finish the job, much like Christopher Scarver was with Jeffrey Dahmer back in the day. I wanted to approach him and see, like, what was you not getting for you to understand the fact that you did is not understandable he said i approached him like what's going on with you then it just goes on to basically say that Dwayne stafford saw those nine people who dylan Rue brutally murdered as family and then the article ends right there's a very short article but i had to make sure to put this in there as well because the what i read did not include this as well as the part about dylan Rue being taken to burger king and with that being said i'm going to bring episode 29 of the black massacre series to a close this was episode 29 the charleston mass shooting or mass murder however you would like to prefer to call it as and be sure to tune in next week as i bring to you episode 30 of the black massacre series and it will also be the last episode of the series so make sure to tune in for that if you have not done so already make sure to go ahead and check out the black massacre series playlist to recap or just check in to see what episodes you may have missed of the series thus far be safe and be one